So there's no denying that Bong Joon Ho's 2019 Best Picture earning film Parasite is something special. Not only did it make history as being the first predominantly foreign language speaking film to take the win, but it also since has stood out as an example of what world cinema is capable of, and that countries outside of America are often capable of making not only films that are as good as those from the US, but even surpassing them with particular titles too. With that being said, Parasite reigns superior over just about everything to me. In just after seven or eight months of it, I've thought about it enough, returned to it enough, and love it enough to consider it to be one of my all-time favorite films. It is spectacular in every sense of the word. The term perfect would probably do it injustice. But anyway, let's get into talking about why, and for those that haven't seen it, this is going to be spoilerific. Also, come on, see it already. So straight off the bat, the film presents us with an even pretty on the nose comparison in which the rich people live in the upper valleys of the city as opposed to the poorer people who live literally beneath them. It's an obvious and simplistic yet deeply rich illustration of the representation of opportunity and privilege and sets us up for quite a literal rise to the top as the main family of the Kims make their way there by tricking those better off in the Park family. The film from there on goes to show us what the difference between the classes really are and perhaps even that sometimes they're not so different, which can be obviously picked out when comparing the Parks and Kims in that they're kind of a mirrored group of people to each other. You know, they're both a four-person family with a mother, father, and two kids, but one family is like the richer, younger, flashier model of the pair. Anyway, I think the defining scene slash line in Parasite, the one that really perfectly encapsulates the entirety of its point, is this one. It's the one scene set the morning after the eventful night of the Kim's big failure, in which they find the old maid's secret husband downstairs, they nearly get caught living in the house from their bamboozled employers, and finally and painfully they become become victims in a flooding where their house is decimated by water. Anyway, as I was saying, the defining scene, in my opinion, is where Mrs. Park says something like, I'm paraphrasing, but she says, Ah, it's raining. What a blessing. As she looks outside her beautiful home and proves to us that she has the privilege to see the half glass full in a situation that's devastated many others, and in fact is even oblivious to the different circumstances around her. Others who are merely a suburb or two over have just had the worst night of their lives while she knows none the wiser. The line is portrayed in such a throwaway manner too, like it's only given a second's thought. It's not that big of a deal to Mrs. Park that it rained, you know, it's just something that's like nice for a garden or whatever. And then she goes goes about her day preparing for this suddenly so urgent party that she must invite everybody she knows to. And I love that comparison here, it's just one more thing adding on to a perfect contrast between the film's characters. The film overall though wants us to look at the families within as separate, as different. And that's an ingenious yet kind of wrong way to look at it. We look at the Parks as somebody we'd want to be, more so than the Kims. However the Kims represent what we as viewers feel more related to. You know, they're more grounded, they're the more real people. You know, they're the underdogs, so we side with them. They're the ones with the smarts, the likable personalities. They're the ones that fight their way to the top over the parks. In particular, Mrs. Park, who is constantly being portrayed as ignorant and someone who is easily taken advantage of. And then the film has another angle to look at it from as well. The movie doesn't want us to hate the Park family, but perhaps even pity them. Amongst the jealousy thrown towards them from the Kims throughout the movie, and even perhaps from us as a viewer, there's also a level of looking down upon them, knowing the knowledge that they don't. When the Kims have something over them here. Unbeknownst to them, they are being tricked by not only one family but two, and they're being taken for a ride. To the extent where you're sitting there like, yeah, maybe their financial situation is desirable, but at least I'm not so goddamn gullible. It's a weird, twisty, and turny thought process when it comes to deciding how you feel about each of the characters, because though while the Parks may have this ignorant privilege, they've also, for most of the film, arguably done nothing wrong. There is a reasonable thought train in which someone may even call them the victims in this film, and they wouldn't be totally wrong. The Kims, however, are doing something that could be considered mean and illegal, but we side with them regardless. And that's because they're the underdogs. And the whole point of the film here is to show whether the Kims have a choice in this matter or not. If they don't take this advantage where they can, how do they advance otherwise? They don't, I think is the answer. And from this point of view, it's like, well, then what's so wrong about a few white lies here and there to majorly improve their lives? You know, is that right? Is that wrong? I don't even think that's the question. Is it what had to be done? Would you do it in these circumstances? Those are the questions. 
The film has a lot to say about the economy and money in as to what it does to people and does so by exploring the characters deeply in a way that I don't think has quite been done before, at least not in this way. The intense brilliance to Parasite is just how many ways there are to look at this film from. Because the halfway point kind of turns everything on its head and I kind of think should speak to the middle class loudest over anyone. Not only does the film generously change genres from a quirky dark comedy to a full blown horror, but it also changes the game in a number of ways. We learn that there is another level beneath the Kims. We see that maybe they aren't in as bad a situation as they seem. And that now that they've exposed those beneath them, that not only do they have to continue the facade to try and make it to the top, but now they also have to push those beneath them down even further and fight. The halfway twist also proves to us that like in real life, things can always get so much worse. And that the worst of everything might just be much further down the line than you think. That as shitty a situation as you think you might be in in life, that there are always still those less fortunate. Because, you know, if you've got a roof over your head, if you get the chance to eat every day, if you have the privilege to watch this video, you're doing all right. Here I think the film is kind of comparing the rich to, well, the rich and the Kim's family to everyday people, the mass where they represent you and me as we watch the film. You know, there's a reason that they're the protagonists. And if what I've said so far is true, then the man who is revealed to have been living in the basement of the park's house for a number of years must represent anything below that. You know, homeless people, the less fortunate, maybe even beyond that. And I think the choice to reveal how bad things are for people even worse off than the Kim family coming in halfway through the film is purposefully done to make the middle class think twice about their own situation. We sit there identifying with the Kims being like, yeah, they've got a shit. And then when it's revealed that the other people have it so much worse, it's like, well, damn. The Kims here don't have it nearly as bad. I don't have it nearly as bad. There is always somebody in an even worse situation. Remember how lucky you are. Another aspect to the film's comparison of the rich and the poor comes in the thematic mentioning of Mr. Park not being able to handle how he describes the terrible smell of poor people. It is here where we start seeing the Parks in a less favourable, less innocent light, and more so in an angering, frustrating kind of way. He speaks of the poor as if he is so much better than them, as if he is all that different from them, as if he's a harder worker than them, more respectable than them, so on and so on. The film goes as far into showing us that the Parks even fetishise the idea idea of being poor. It's so taboo to them that it can become a stupid little sex game that they awkwardly play. The film goes on to further portray Mr. Park as being an arrogant and selfish person in a few different ways. One of the first that comes to mind is when he pushes Mr. Kim into working out of his job description, like by making him play stupid party games with his family, carry stuff, all that sort of stuff, extra stuff, rather than just being a driver. However, when it comes to these sorts of jobs, you know, there's kind of a relationship there too, and the, the lines are kind of blurred. Perhaps those responsibilities were to be expected upon hiring, I'm not sure. But predominantly, Mr. Park proves his arrogance in the climactic scene, in which the man from the basement has emerged and he has caused sheer havoc among the party going on in the park's backyard. Here we have a freshly wounded Jessica, or Ki Jung, the daughter of the Kim family and the son of the Park's family, Da Song, who amongst the chaos has been induced with a seizure in which had previously been discussed could be a life-threatening altercation in which must be taken care of in the next 10 minutes. And here, of course, Mr. Park yells at his employee to help his son, calling him to action with the intent of Mr. Kim driving them to the hospital, unbeknownst to him, of course, that that's his daughter right there, who has just been fatally stabbed. But here I argue that that doesn't matter. It doesn't, the context of her being his family doesn't matter. I don't care if he knows that or not. He is still proving that he thinks his life and his son's life has more worth over those around him. He yells selfishly as if he is all that matters in this unruly, godforsaken dystopia of a party. It can be defended that, yes, he in a very stressful situation and that he didn't mean harm by that but he still holds such high disregard for another's life here and it makes me lose a lot of respect for that character so anyway eventually he just decides to go by himself so he goes about getting the car keys with one final action though he holds his nose in order to not smell those once again beneath him and the final decision is made by Mr. Kim he kills Park because he has been pushed over the edge that straw that broke the camel's back was this exaggerated reaction to a smell even in a situation as dire as this Mr. Park still must prove his worth and be petty enough to distinguish himself apart from those below. The end of the film here proves that this was never the way to go about it though and that giving in to those desires to punch beneath the belt and to do wrong to get ahead shows us that it got nothing for Mr. Kim who ends the film residing beneath the basement once more taking place of the man that discovered earlier in the film. And this all comes to place in the very few last shots in which Kevin or Kai Wu hopes for the best looking forward. We see a vision of what he hopes to happen yet we expect more 
might just not. The ending proves that there is still hope within him that the ambition and drive has not been killed off in Kevin, but that just having the drive isn't going to do it. Otherwise, we probably would have gotten a definitive scene showing that he did reach that goal. Instead, we get hopes and promises and Morse code. All the characters are left with the same desires of being better off financially as they had at the start. In the end, they really got nowhere. So, that's enough for today, but I just want to say I could go on all day, like all day, easily. There is so much more to unpack in Parasite as a film. It's so metaphorical. But I'll leave you with this. Both families throughout the film feed off each other in one way or another. I think that the titular term of Parasite applies to all those involved, and even plays as a criticism of capitalism. We see this as the Kims take advantage and feed off of a host and the park's privilege, as they do the same in return for a feeling of superiority and power. It is in this world that is constantly running on money and chewing up and spitting out those that don't have it that force people to do things like this. And I think Parasite as a film overall might just be suggesting that there might be a better way to go about it about living than competing with those among us, but that we may never know what that is.